Good morning, everyone. Good to see this great group out to worship the Lord this morning. I just want to say to all you younger generation people, it's a joy to see you in our church this morning. We need you. The church needs you. And you need us. Amen? We're more than just old people. We have things you need and knowledge you need. I have a ministry, a mentoring ministry, where I mentor young people. And what a joy it is. It helps keep me young. But it's just an honor and a privilege to know the Lord, to walk with Him, to serve Him. And so I just, this isn't my message this morning. This is for free. Well, it's all for free, but... (laughs) I just want to challenge you. Don't take the church for granted. Love it. Serve in it. Love God in it. And show your love of God through the church. Because we need you to keep the churches alive. Without you, the churches will die. And so as a mentor, I want to challenge you this morning to be committed, to be faithful. Make up your mind now. You're going to serve the Lord regardless of what happens to you or around you. Because those who hope in the Lord, Isaiah says, will never be disappointed. Well, we're going to be looking at Judges chapter 2, starting with verse 6 and going through 311. It's page 166 in your pew Bible. And when Pastor Lynn assigned this to me, I thought, Lynn, what are you doing? (laughs) Judges? But I tell you what, this passage has really spoken to my heart. And I've really seen how it is so significant to where we are in our culture in America and the time we're living in and the days we are facing. And so to this morning, we're going to be looking at human nature and God's nature in this passage of scripture but before we begin let's bow our heads for a word of prayer heavenly father we come before you we thank you for your word and lord we know that your word is what has authority i have no authority this church has no authority but it's when we proclaim the word of god that the authority of god is manifested through your holy spirit and through your truth and so heavenly father i'm asking you this morning to let your word impact us. May we not just come, sit, and listen, and go home, and not be impacted by your word. So Holy Spirit, make your strength perfect in my weakness as I speak and deliver your word. I pray that you'll bring conviction, encouragement, and hope as we look at your word this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, one of the things about human nature is forgetfulness. Is there anyone here that ever forgets things? I look at some of these young people sometimes, and I see them forgetting, and I think, you're too young to be forgetting like that. The other day, I was on my phone, and I had this subconscious thing I do, and I don't even know I do it, where I usually have my phone right here, and I kind of just put my arm down to feel my phone. Or I'll check my wallet to make sure I have that. And the other day I was talking on my phone, had my phone up here, and I kind of went down here like here. Oh, man, what did I do with my phone? (laughs) Literally, I did that. (laughs) And they're having me preach? (laughs) I read a quote. It says, I've expanded my skills. Now I can forget what I'm doing actually while I'm doing it. Probably one of the most annoying things in forgetfulness is passwords on the computer. I think we can all relate to that. I've come up with a system that works pretty good, but I found one better. As I was studying and reading, I, I ran across this. And, and so here's the way to remember your password. I changed my password to the word incorrect. So when I forget my password, the computer will say, your password is incorrect. (laughs) I thought that was pretty clever. I wish I would have thought of it. (laughs) But then on a more serious note this morning, I read a quote. It is fatal to forget the Heavenly Father. 
In this passage, we're looking at the human nature and God's nature. And in this passage, we will see the ending of Joshua's life and reign and the beginning of a new era of judges that God would raise up to try to save his people. And so at this point, we're going to first begin by looking at the tragedy of the human nature, or we could even say the sinful human nature, who we are when God is not in our lives. And the first characteristic of the human nature I want to look at is forgetfulness. Look at 6 through 10. It's on the screen. And we're going to be reading this passage, chapter 2, verses 6 through 10. After Joshua had dismissed the Israelites, they went to take possession of the land, each to their own inheritance. The people served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua and of the elders who outlived him and who had seen all the great things the Lord had done for Israel. Joshua, son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110. And they buried him in the land of his inheritance, in Timnath Heres, in the hill country of Ephraim, north of Mount Gosh. After the whole generation had been gathered to their ancestors, in other words, that whole generation had died, another generation grew up, who neither knew the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. You know, there are sometimes being forgetful can be a blessing. Some things need to be forgotten. Amen? Put behind us and move on. But often being forgetful can be very annoying but it can even be dangerous or even fatal. If you forget as you drive home today which side of the road you're supposed to be on, it could be fatal. Amen? I'm amazed and troubled at the same time as I read the accounts of the Israelite people who were known as God's chosen people. This passage is not to heathens who never heard of God. These are God's chosen people, the one he had delivered, the one he had cared for and loved. They had experienced so many outstanding miracles from God Almighty. Deliverance from Egyptian slavery and the crossing of the Red Sea on dry ground. They had experienced God's presence by a pillar of smoke by day and a pillar of fire by night. They'd seen water come out of hard rock. They'd seen manna come down from heaven daily to feed them and meet their needs. But then more recently, here in our story, in the context of this scripture, 30 years before Joshua had died, they had seen the water part at the Jordan River. They crossed, and they'd seen the massive, over 12-foot thick walls of Jericho come crumbling down at the sound of the trumpets, and God gave them victory over their enemy. But then we see human nature take over. Here it is, only 30 years after the victory at Jericho that Joshua dies and by the time his generation was gone they had already forgotten the Lord and what he had done for Israel I've always wondered and been puzzled even as I look at our nation and I see sometimes the direction we are heading if God doesn't intervene how can we not learn from history Study the Romans, study history, and see that they took that path and it didn't work for them either. But then I realize we don't do a very good job of learning from history because we forget. Amen? We think we're better. We think we can handle it. We can do it and get by with it. But the sinful human nature does not stop at just forgetting. It goes on to say in verse 11, 
Then the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord and served the Baals. And if you study the Baals, one of their titles is they seen themselves, the Baals were the Lord of this earth. Earthy God. So they turned and did evil. They just didn't forget. And understand, the word evil is a powerful word. Evil means profound immorality. Profound wickedness. When people forget God and do not know him, they will turn away from God and do what is evil in God's sight. And America is a prime modern day example of this very thing. I mean, seriously, as I stand here before you, it almost it grieves my heart and it weighs heavy on my heart as I say this. Who would have ever thought in America, the land founded upon our fathers who believed in God's word and freedom of religion and freedom to worship God would come to the day that whoever thought we would get to the place where we can kill babies and call it health care. But as we read on, we see the Israelites continue this downward spiral. Next, it says in verse 12, they forsook, forsook the Lord, the God of their ancestors, who had brought them out of Egypt. They followed and worshiped various gods of the peoples around them. In other words, they were following the culture. They forsook God. They abandoned him. They deserted him. They literally turned their back on him. They gave him up and rejected and disowned him. Need I remind us they're doing this to the creator of the heavens and the earth. Not just someone that rubbed them wrong or they didn't like next door but to the God of all gods, the creator of the heavens and the earth. This is how they were treating him. Here they begin by forgetting him, failing to remember him, failing to recall him, failing to think of him. For now they are deliberately abandoning him, deserting God, turning their back on God, rejecting and disowning him. But they don't stop there. Trust me, folks. The story will get better. Hold on. But we need to look at the truth, amen? It's not pleasant. It's not pretty. But they went further from there. Now it goes on in verse 17. They would not listen. God had raised up judges now. Joshua and his generation is gone, and God is still caring about his people. And so he again attempts to save them by giving them judges. And now we come to verse 17, and it says, They would not listen to their judges, but prostituted themselves to other gods and worshiped them. They quickly turned from the ways of their ancestors who had been obedient to the Lord's command they would not listen they turned a deaf ear towards God do you know in psychology and if you study one of the worst forms of rejection is not listening to someone and just as if they didn't exist treating them as if they were not there I thought of an experiment I heard about or read about years ago where there was a, an, a, a lab that studied uh, behavioral issues and experimented in a behavioral lab. And so they brought in a little puppy dog. And as they were doing their lab and as the little puppy dog went around to different people, they would pet it and they would love on it and they would talk to it. And if it barked or had a need, they would listen to it. Sometimes they'd pick it up and cuddle it. And it was thriving. But then later on, they, in the lab, they're doing an experiment. They decided to neglect this little puppy. Ignore it. 
not pay attention to it, not listen to it. And that little puppy grew sick. And of course, they took care of it. But it shows how important it is and how offending and damaging it is when we reject. Can you imagine? Not that we're going to hurt God. God's God. He's always going to be God. But can you imagine how it hurts the heart of God when we reject Him? But then it got a little worse. In verses 18 through 19, I'm just going to be reading 19 right now, they refused to give up evil. They were stubborn. Look what verse 19 says. But when the judge died, the people returned to ways even more corrupt than those of their ancestors, following other gods and serving and worshiping them. They refused to give up their evil practices and stubborn ways. So what's the result of living just in the human nature without God? We forget God. We do evil and become profoundly immoral and wicked. We forsake God and follow the culture. We don't listen to God. And we're stubborn and refuse to give up that which we know is evil or sinful in our lives. But fortunately, that's not the end of the story here. But in God's response we, to this and all this wickedness, we see the nature of God. So let, let's look at the reality and the hope of God's nature. First, I want to look at the reality of God's nature. In verse 12, at the end of the verse, it says... They aroused the Lord's anger. God was angry. I think we've so redefined God in our culture a lot of times that we almost think that, oh, he can't get angry. He's a loving God. But we see the nature of God here in response to that which violates him and violates his people and does damage to them. And he was angry. Now, it's not angry like if... If Lynn cuts me off on the highway, I get angry at him and want to run him off the road. We're not talking about that kind of anger. We're talking about a righteous anger. An anger that hates that which hurts people. Amen? You ever see an injustice of someone? And just this anger rises up within you to think that anyone could treat another person that way. That's righteous anger. Now, we have to be careful what we do with it. Make sure we carry it out righteously. But we need to be reminded God gets angry. And then in verse 14, God gave them over to their enemies. In his anger, it says, against Israel, the Lord gave them into the hands of the raiders who plundered them. He sold them into the hands of their enemies all around whom they no longer were able to resist. When we reject God, things go south quickly. God gave them over to their enemies. And I know there's going to be some people who say, well, wait a minute, Pastor Rick, that's, that's the Old Testament. Things are different now. Since Jesus came and we're living in the new dispensation of Christ, things are different. I would beg to differ 1 Corinthians 5, 4 through 5 says, and this was Paul, they had a man doing some wicked things among them. And it says, so when you are assembled and I am with you in spirit and the power of our Lord Jesus Christ is present, hand this man over to Satan or to the enemy for the destruction of the flesh so that in his spirit he may be saved on the day of the Lord. Now the context of this goes right along with Judges. The Greek word for flesh here is sarx. It refers to the sinful state of human beings often presented as a power in opposition to the Spirit of God. And then when Timothy was dealing with those who rejected, when Paul was talking to Timothy about those who rejected the faith, he says, among them 
are Harmonius and Alexander, who I'm, I have had handed over to Satan to be taught not to blaspheme. Sometimes God has to teach us some hard lessons, amen? Not because he wants to destroy us, not because he hates us, because he loves us. Hoping to get our attention, hoping to save us. And then it goes on to say in verse 15, God was against them. Whenever Israel went out to fight, the scripture says, the hand of the Lord was against them to defeat them, just as he had sworn to them, and they were in great distress. Now, if you're not a little disconcerted yet, look at the next verse. Chapter 3, we're going to jump to, verses 7 through 8. He sold them. The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. They forgot the Lord, their God, and served the Baals and the Asherahs. The anger of the Lord burned against Israel so that he sold them into the hands of Kishon, Rishathaim, king of Aram, Naharim, to whom the Israelites were subject for eight years. He sold them. Uh, how could he do that? Then I thought of my kids growing up and the times I thought I could sell them. <laughs> what are you laughing about? Have you thought about selling your kids? <laughs> I had a friend of mine in the church I was pastor, and he says, Rick, and he had teenagers a little before I did. He says, Rick, I don't know. I don't think teenagers are human. <laughs> uh, we love our teenagers, amen? For eight years, God sold them and turned them over into the enemy's hand, trying to wake them up and get their attention. That is the reality of who God is in His holiness. He cannot and He will not tolerate sin and rebellion, especially rebellion. I'm going to tell, tell on my little three year old grandson, and it's not to be mean, you know what three year olds can be like. We were out the other day, and I took him to the bathroom to wash his hands, and something didn't go quite right the way he thought it would go. And I tried to hand him a paper towel and he was mad he was rebellious man he just knocked that out of my hands I don't know about you but I'm not very tolerant of rebellious children <laughs> I didn't hit him I didn't harm him but I wasn't very happy with him God's a holy God he's offended when we rebel against him he's not a wishy-washy big sugar daddy in the sky who ignores that which corrupts and violates who he is my heart goes out to the younger generation a lot of times because we put so many of this generation at a disadvantage by failing to discipline them and teach them boundaries and tell them no to things that are damaging it's not that we're trying to be mean. We care about him, amen? That same little three-year-old grandson of mine, the best thing can be done in the yard is to build a fence around it and set boundaries. Not so he's in bondage, but so he can go out and play freely without getting run over by a car. It's a fearful thing as well to be on the wrathful side of God but fortunately that is not all that God is he is more for God's desire this morning is not to destroy God's desire is to restore amen that's why Jesus came that's why he died on the cross that's why he shed his blood that's why he paid the sacrifice for us because he would rather die on the cross than see us perish that's how much he loves us that's how much he cares for us so that brings us to the hope of God's nature as I studied this you know I grew up in a lot of legalism and I didn't have a lot of exposure probably there was exposure to grace but more law than grace a lot of times more fear than grace 
more threat than grace. Now, I'm not knocking how I was raised up. I came to Christ. I've walked with him. I've known him. So I praise God for my heritage. I'm not knocking everything in that. But it was a little shy on grace. <clears throat> but after eight years of slavery to the enemy, the people cried out to God, and he hears their cry. Look what it says in the Scripture. But when they cried out to the Lord, he raised up for them a deliverer, Othniel, son of Canaz, Caleb's younger brother, who saved them. And I look at that. When they cried out, God delivered and saved them. God raised up Othniel, a righteous judge who would give them hope and hopefully deliverance. And we go on in verse 10 of chapter 3. When they cried out, the Spirit of God moved, and God gave them victory. Here's what the Scripture says. The Spirit of the Lord came on him so that he became Israel's judge and went to war. The Lord gave Kashan Rishathim, king of Aram, into the hands of Othniel, who overpowered him. When they cried out to God, He gave them peace. Again, verse 11. So the land had peace for 40 years until Othniel, son of Canaz, died. This morning, we need to be reminded and aware that there are consequences to offending and rebelling against God. Amen? We need to be reminded of who God is according to His Word and according to His character, not who we have made Him to be or who we just want Him to be. One of my greatest concerns for the culture of America and the church culture as well is that in so many preachers and so many churches, we are redefining who God and who Jesus are. And when I was younger, I'd read the scripture and it would talk about in the last days there'll be many false Christs. And I thought there'd be these people who'd stand up and say, I'm Jesus. Well, that can happen and it does happen. But I think it's more subtle than that. I think in the last days, there'll be many false Christ because we redefine who God is. We redefine who Jesus is. And we make up all these false Christ to fit us rather than us fitting ourselves into his holiness. We need to be reminded of God's holiness and judgment on sin and rebellion. We need to face the reality and danger of forgetting and rejecting God. To remind ourselves of the quote I read earlier, it is fatal to forget our Heavenly Father. The holiness of God did not change when Jesus came. And I'm not going to read it, but if you're not convinced of that, go home after church, after lunch, and read Second Peter chapter 2. So I'd like to throw out some challenging questions this morning. And understand, these are for me as well as for you this morning. Do we forget God when we are around our unbelieving friends and co-workers? Do and are we really listening to God and seeking His will and seeking Him and His Word? For us today. Does our lifestyle please and reflect God or do we arouse his anger? Are we living in God's holiness? And understand we're talking about by grace and by the power of the Holy Spirit, not the flesh. Are we living in God's holiness for our lives? Or are we refusing to give up some evil or sin that we are aware of? in our lives. But we also need to be aware and reminded that it pays to submit to God and honor Him. Amen? 
There are rewards for submitting to God and honoring Him. When we surrender to God's authority in our lives out of love for Him, we have His favor. And if I'm going to have anyone on my side, I want it to be God. Amen? If I have God on my side, it don't really matter what the enemy has on his side. Our God is greater. Our God is stronger. Our God is mighty. Amen? And God delivers us out of bondage to Satan and sin. When we get sick and tired of sin and its bondage, we can cry out to God in repentance, and He will hear us, and He will respond to us. And God's Spirit moves and comes on His people and on His leaders when we submit to His authority in our lives. And God gives us victory over the enemy and sin. But then lastly, which I think we all so long for, God gives us peace. Amen. In this passage, we see God's holiness, His judgments, His correction, but we also see His grace. As I come down to the end of this passage, it really just touched my heart again and kind of gave me a bigger picture of God's grace. In all that the Israelites did to mess things up, and all they had to do is turn towards God and cry out to Him, and He shows up. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen? And I'll be honest with you. I'm old enough. I've seen enough change. I've seen how dramatically the pendulum has swung towards wickedness and endorsing sin and legalizing sin and that which is contrary to God's Word, that sometimes I almost feel like there's no hope for America. And I get a little emo. Is that the right word? But then I read this passage, and I look at the Israelites, and I look how bad they messed up and how poorly they treated God. And yet, when they finally came to their senses, all they had to do is turn to God, cry out to Him, and He came and delivered them and saved them and gave them peace. Wow. I just want to remind you this morning because I never know who I'm speaking to in a crowd this size. But I think it's for all of us. Remember, no matter what we may have done or are doing, if we really get sick of it, tired of it, we cry out to God, He responds. Let me share with Hebrews 11.6, one of the pillars of our faith. It says, and without faith it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to Him must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who earnestly seek Him. Amen? There it is again. All we have to do is seek Him and He will reward us. 2 Corinthians 7, 1 says, Therefore, since we have these promises, dear friends, let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit, perfecting holiness out of reverence for God. And then I close with this verse, Second Chronicles 7, 14, and I know we know this, but listen to what it says. If my people, talking to us, amen, not the world, not that God doesn't care about the world, we're here to reach the world. But if my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven. I'll forgive their sin. And I'll heal their land. Heavenly Father, Help us not to forget who you are. Help us to realize who you are, both in your holiness 
and your judgment and also in your grace and your love. Heavenly Father, I just pray that your Holy Spirit would just challenge us, convict us if necessary, and help us, Lord, to realize the danger of forgetting you and walking away from you. Oh, we don't have to serve you. You don't force us to serve you, but you invite us to follow you and serve you because you love us. So whoever we are here this morning, even if we've thought about just walking away from it all, it just don't seem to pay, may we make a commitment to be faithful to you because we know in the end we will not be disappointed because we put our faith in God. And so, Lord, wake us up if we're asleep spiritually. Wake up our nation. Wake up our churches. Wake up our pastors And help us, Lord, to really seek your face and see revival in the land. May we cry out to you and discover your grace. In Jesus' name.